In this lecture segment, we pivot to talking about the art of the Northern Renaissance. We will focus on a manuscript, a sculpture, and an altarpiece for devotion in the home. We are going back in time to talk about art during the 14th to 16th centuries in Northern Europe, which includes France, the Duchy of Burgundy, which was an area associated with but also rivaling the King of France, Flanders, or present-day Belgium, Germany, which is part of the Holy Roman Empire, and the Netherlands. We have a similar flourishing of the arts during a period of economic growth, expanding urban populations, and commercial activities, like the trade supported by the banking industry. We pick up our story at the end of the medieval period, but like we saw in Italy, much of art during the Renaissance is a continuation of trends and styles we saw during the Gothic period. Our patrons of art in the North will be kings, dukes, and merchants in cities who want works of art for private devotion in their homes. The demand for art goes up, and the result will be a flood of artists who specialize in making certain types of art. We also see the rise of new media, like printmaking. An open market for art develops, with artists creating art not for specific patrons, but on spec for potential buyers. We end up with the popularization of art, unlike anything we've seen in European history to this point, as art is not just owned by churches and the wealthy, but by the innkeeper, the merchant, and the banker. In the 15th century, it is the art of Northern Europe that is most popular in Europe, as they export tapestries, carved wooden altarpieces, paintings, and stained glass. This map shows you the trading routes of this period that connected areas we've been talking about in Italy with Northern Europe, showing how interconnected these areas were. It is not until the 16th century that tastes begin to shift and Italian creations become the new coolness. In Italy, we identified Gothic, Italo-Byzantine, and classical sculpture as the foundation of artistic production at the start of the Italian Renaissance. In Northern Europe in the 14th century, the artistic foundation includes tapestry production, stained glass, the language of Gothic architecture, and the courtly, elegant Gothic style with its curved body and elongated form that we saw in The Virgin and Child. We see this style continuing in the early 15th century in a manuscript commissioned by a Duke of Burgundy, a regional leader who was brother to the King of France, who was in charge of the territory in gold that you see on this map. Jean de Berry was an active patron of the arts. You can see a portrait of him here from a page in the text we will talk about. He loved little beautiful things, like this text, a precious object with pages of vellum made of calfskin. And you can see part of the process of making the pages out of vellum here and decorated using expensive pigments like ultramarine that you see here, which comes from a stone that is only found in Afghanistan. This text was made by the three Lamborg brothers who were trained as goldsmiths but apply their skills instead to manuscript painting. We've seen a manuscript before, the Book of Kells, which was a gospel book. This text, the Trévisheur, is a book of hours, a personalized prayer book filled with prayers to be said at different times of the day. It's about the size of a piece of paper, and like so many northern works of art, was intended to be closely held by the viewer, creating an intimate relationship with the object. It includes pages for each month of the year. This page depicting April shows elegant members of the court engaged in seasonal outdoor pursuits appropriate for spring, their elongated bodies resembling the elegant form of our Gothic virgin and child. But we see a different style used in the February page, which shows not the members of the court, but regular folk trying to keep themselves warm on a cold winter day. Instead of elongated figures, elegant figures, we see folks in everyday dress, doing everyday things chopping wood, warming themselves by the fire, all set with a, within a scene chock full of detail. The type of fencing they used, how they house their animals, for example. We see a clear interest in the everyday world and in showing regular life, using as much detail as can be packed in. And we see interest in color and texture and in merging the sacred, this is a book of prayers after all, and the secular. Another component of the artistic foundation of the North is that they don't have hunks of classical sculpture laying about. They have Gothic churches with portal sculpture, and this next work of art grows out of that tradition. The closest thing they have to monumental sculpture is the Well of Moses, another commission for a Duke of Burgundy, Jean's brother Philip. 
You can see its location here in this drawing. It was created for the cloister of a monastery in Dijon, France. What remains of it is housed in this little building. You can see the sculpture here. Initially, it had a base with six Old Testament prophets and then a crucifixion scene up above, showing that prefiguration we talked about, that the Old Testament lays the foundation for the New Testament that fulfills the prophecies of the Old. We are looking at two of the Old Testament prophets, David and Jeremiah. We see characteristics we've already seen, loads of detail, bright color, much of which has faded, but this would have been vividly colored or polychromed initially, and some other characteristics of Northern Renaissance art as well. We see individualized faces with the kingly David and the wizened Jeremiah peering down his nose at his text. We can see individual pages, wrinkles, strands of hair, and the texture of fabric and the book cover. We see expressions, especially in the morning angels up above the prophets, who each show their grief at Christ's death in different ways. And we see nobody. While this artist Klaus Sluter and his team are interested in the naturalism of the expression and the details, we do not see an interest in depicting a naturalistic body with anatomical knowledge. The body is smothered in layers of fabric that pool at the bottom around feet that do not seem attached to the body. It's as if they are just there because a figure needs feet. So we see a fundamentally different way of thinking of the body in the North and in thinking of the job, a job of drapery. Drapery here does not show the body as we see developing in Italy. It surrounds the body. This area was heavily in this area was heavily involved in the cloth trade, which might contribute to this culture's interest in showing drapery in such detail and in such quantity. In both the North and the South, we see rising naturalism, but that naturalism is expressed differently. In the Southern or Italian Renaissance, we see an interest in depicting naturalistic anatomy and using perspective to create a convincing illusion of space. But in the Northern Renaissance, we see an interest in depicting naturalistic expressions and emotions, individualized portraits and details. In contrast to the blend of paintings and sculpture that we looked at in the Italian Renaissance, in the Northern Renaissance, from this point, we are only looking at paintings. Small works of art for religious devotion in the home are the most common type of art during this period. And this work, which you can see at the cloisters in New York City today, is a stellar example. It is by the artist Robert Campin, who had a painting workshop in a city in Belgium, meaning a city in Flanders. He was a member of the Painters Guild and the Goldsmiths Guild, and was a well-respected member of the community, even serving in city government. He created this work of art on spec, so without a buyer in mind, and then personalized it for a particular family, adding portraits of the husband and wife who owned the work and their coat of arms. It is an altarpiece, remember the Chimabue altarpiece we looked at. Its purpose was to be a focus of devotion during worship. The small work of art was intended for private prayer in the home. It's a triptych, so an altarpiece with three panels, with wings on the left and right that can fold over the central image. In the left panel, we are on the ground level and see the husband, Peter Engelbrecht, who was a cloth merchant of the upper middle class. He is shown kneeling in a garden with his second wife behind him, whose portrait was added later. They are both witnesses to the central scene, a depiction of the Annunciation. In the Annunciation, the angel Gabriel visits Mary and announces that she will bear the Christ child. It's a really important moment, and it is when the incarnation takes place, the moment that God takes human form and becomes mortal. And this is the perfect scene for a family whose last name means angel bringer, Engelbrecht. But look at the setting for this sacred scene. It does not look like the New Testament period or in a heavenly realm with a golden sky. It looks like a typical central room of a northern Flemish home. And this is really significant. This super sacred scene is shown in a space that looks like the type of home where these folks lived. The sacred has been made familiar. In the right panel, we see Joseph in a setting laden with everyday detail. Look at the joints in the table. And we look out onto a typical Flemish city with people in the clothing of that time going shopping to church or on their way home. Think about the degree of engagement here for the viewer who sees this very sacred scene looking like it's taking place at home and in a familiar city. 
Let's look more closely at this central scene. Mary's body looks a lot like a painted version of the figures at the Well of Moses. The artist is very interested in the cloth and in creating a beautiful female figure, but his depiction is not undergirded by an understanding of anatomy. We do have perspective, but it is not mathematical perspective. It's what we call intuitive perspective. Lines, like the ceiling beam, seem to lead towards the horizon line, and objects get smaller when they are further away. Objects are depicted according to their characteristics. The table has all of its parts, and the wood grain is depicted with a high degree of naturalism. But the tabletop looks like the items on it should be sliding off. So again, we have that selective naturalism, clear detail that makes objects look like the natural world and makes them seem real, but they do not occupy space in a convincing, consistent fashion. And these objects are important to the meaning of this work. They look like typical objects one would find in a home, but they have religious significance. Symbols in Northern Renaissance art are often everyday objects that a viewer at this time could have easily understood as having religious meaning. Mary leans on a bench, but it is a lion throne, like the throne of Solomon. So this has similarities to throne of wisdom imagery, even Khafre back in Egypt. But here the symbol is a piece of furniture. Joseph makes a grape press, grapes as an old Christian symbol. We saw them at Santa Costanza in the early Christian period. We have three levels in the altarpiece, on the ground, elevated above the street, and in a tower, with Mary elevated to protect her purity. Lilies also represent Mary's purity. This depiction of lilies also refers to the Trinity, as we have three flowers on one stem, three in one, and one of the flowers is just budding, just coming into being, which represents Christ. The scene is laden with many more symbols that are underground, merged with everyday objects infused with spiritual meaning. The only overt symbol is the mini Christ dive bombing through the window into Mary's womb. The other symbols are everyday objects. This altarpiece embodies characteristics of Northern Renaissance art in the 15th century. It's a small-scale work of art for devotion in the home. It merges sacred and secular in an everyday context. We have intuitive perspective and selective naturalism, with objects depicted according to the characteristics, with a wealth of detail. The amazing range of details that allows for the representation of the qualities and characteristics of these objects is made possible by northern artists' mastery of oil paint. As we talked about in Venetian art, oil paints are slow drying and are built up in layers creating luminous color and texture. Artists can continue working the paint and can add layers that allow for the representation of textures with a high degree of naturalism to make painted cloth look like actual cloth, for example, or make painted wood look like actual wood. Oil paint heightens the naturalism of the scene. If we compare this to Masaccio's Trinity that was made at the same time, we learn a great deal about the character of the Renaissance. Both show people witnessing sacred scenes. But the settings are quite different, an ideal, imagined space of classicized architecture versus a Flemish home. One uses linear perspective, while the other creates a sense of space using intuitive perspective. One shows an interest in the depiction of the human body and in creating naturalistic human form, while the other is concerned with showing objects and figures according to their details, that selective naturalism. One is a fresco painted with tempera paint that creates a flat, non-reflective surface, while the other is painted with oil paint that creates a luminous surface that presents naturalistic, brightly colored details. One is a public work for a church in Florence, and the other was made for private devotion in the home and intended to create an intimate experience for the worshiper to help them focus their devotions. One uses overt symbols like showing the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove completing the trinity of God, Christ, and Holy Spirit, while the other uses domestic or everyday objects as symbols, like the lily standing for the trinity. In this comparison, we see the effects of the different artistic traditions of Northern Europe and Italy, and see that even though both areas are Catholic, their approach to creating sacred imagery is quite different.